a new file. Okay, so the recording has started. Okay, so, um, so we are very happy to have uh, the first uh, the first lecture of uh, of the conference, the first lecture of the day, and it's uh, it's going to be given by Alessandro Vicky, who has been uh, right at the beginning of the conformal bootstrap revival, and he's going uh, to tell us uh, today about the introduction to conformal bootstrap. Uh, so uh, thanks, Alessandro, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Slava. <clears throat> so as a first speaker, let me thank the organizers for this opportunity and for keeping alive this conference, even in these uh, complicated times. So this is going to be an introduction to conformal bootstrap. So for many of you, it will be uh, something that you know very well. Uh, but hopefully for the rest of you that are not so familiar with the uh, conformal field theories in higher dimensions and latest approaches to, to this uh, very nice uh, topic, uh, you will get the chance to, to get to speed and all be on the same page so that you'll be able to follow the rest of the conference uh, in, a, in, a, in a better way. In particular, this is, this is lecture, these lectures are meant to be an introduction to what's going to be to come next with uh, with david poland which will discuss applications of the conform of numerical conformal bootstrap and then uh, latest development discussed by uh, ning uh, in a very nice recent paper with, with slava so hopefully we'll, we'll be on the same page by the end of these four hours and uh, looking at the participants, I, I noticed that most of you are already familiar with uh, many concepts, and in particular with two-dimensional conformal field theories. So we'll try to, to make the analogy and parallelism with uh, what's, what's known in two dimension and what, what changes in high dimension. Okay. So for the, for the first five minutes, I, I prepared uh, sort of slides, but then I'll switch to uh, uh, handwritten notes. So, uh, bear with me for a few moments so that I, I can save time uh, in this introductory part. So let's let's discuss uh, first of all the, the outline of the lecture. Uh, this is what this is the very ambitious outline of the lecture, and I will try to cover a lot of things, uh, hopefully uh, in this order. And uh, but of course I will have to skip many details, so uh, you you you'll have the opportunity to ask as much as many questions as you want. In, during after the lectures and during the lectures, of course. And then these are the references. <clears throat> there, are there are already many uh, reviews on conformal field theories in various approaches and various directions. And this is a, a collection of them. There is a, a review uh, <clears throat> written by myself, Slava, and, uh, and David Poland. Then there are older lectures uh, given uh, in uh, courses at the PFL and during the, the beautiful school at Tazi. There is a, a Weizmann lecture written by Shai Chester, uh, which are very nice and very introductory. And then, of course, there are books where you can find conformity theories. And there is also the standard book on string theory, which discusses uh, string the um, conformity theory to some extent. All right, we are, we are ready to start. So let's start with a, with a very basic fact. Uh, let's start with the, our basic favorite example, which is the Ising model into the matrix. Okay, I will just flash a bunch of known facts. First of all, the, we all know the Ising model is a, a model of spins uh, on, on the discrete lattice, for instance, a square lattice, and you allow the spins to be up and down only. And then there are some interactions. There is an Hamiltonian, which describes, for instance, nearest neighbor interaction. Okay, and using uh, normalization group approaches, for instance, here I, I, I drawn the, the um, action of taking blocking or decimation where you integrate out so only certain spins. Okay, you can, you can show that there, are, there is a fixed point of the normalization group, especially in the, uh, for in, at a finite temperature for dimensions like between two and four. And for instance, this is a sketch of an approximate uh, RG transformation 
that uh, arises when you do the estimation and when you start making approximation because already <coughs> going to going beyond the second step it, it's already hard analytically but nevertheless uh, the uh, the normalization group transformation is a, a transformation in the space of couplings so you start with uh, some couplings j k which are uh, describes all possible interaction that you can have among spins and then you make an energy transformation, you end up with new couplings, J prime, K prime, okay? and this, those are related to the previous one by some certain rules. And then iterating this, these rules become more and more complicated. So here I, I made an, a very brutal approximation, truncating to some order in J. And then already at this, at this level, you discover that uh, there is a fixed point of this transformation that in this case corresponds to setting these couplings to one third and one ninth. And so when you have a fixed point, okay, it means that by making further um, steps of the normalization group, you, you don't change your Hamiltonian. So you eventually you are uh, you, you reach a point where by zooming out, by looking at the system uh, farther and farther, the system behaves always in the same way. Okay, this is a manifestation of scaling bias. This is what we, we mean by scaling bar. The, uh, the system uh, looks the same no matter which energy scale or which length scale you look at. And, and then, of course, there is a, a divergence. Uh, there is a divergence of all the, of, the, of the correlation length, which is the length at which degrees of freedom are correlated among each other. And if you have scaling variance, you, can, you cannot have um, a reference scale, which means that all scales must, must disappear in the system. And this, in fact, is true at, at the fixed point. And then you can learn also other stuff that will be useful in the, in the last lecture when we will try to deal with this, with this, with this uh, model in a more uh, bootstrappy way. So we'll just list them. Um, <clears throat> there is, um, of course, there is a Z2 symmetry at the fixed point, which uh, amounts in flipping all the spins. Okay, the system is the same. And then by looking at the RG flow, you discover, even in this very simple setup that I described, you discover that there is only one um, unstable direction which can drive you out uh, in the um, out of the fixed point. So there is a, a one parameter that you need to adjust in order to go to the fixed point. That, that, that's the only one, it's the temperature basically, and is Z2 preserving. And then in this setup that I described, I didn't add to begin with a magnetic field, but you can do that. And if you do that, then you will discover, of course, there is the magnetic field that has to be tuned in order to reach the fixed point, but there is no other parameter that has to be tuned. So this theory, the Ising model, is a very special theory because, because it only has two unstable oh. directions in the space of, of, of theory, in the, in the RG, oh. RG standards. Okay, so keep in mind these, uh, these very basic facts because they will become very useful in, in the lecture. Well, in fact, the, the hope of these lectures is to develop a framework that will allow us to study the, these critical points, in particular the Ising model, that will be the focus of this lecture, in a quantitative, quantitative way, which means we don't want to understand, okay, there is a fixed point, but who knows how it, may, how, how it looks like really want to uh, not solve the theory because solving the theory is very ambitious, but at least be able to constrain the theory in a very precise way, uh, in a very quantitative, sen quantitative sense, so that you almost uh, solve the theory. Okay? You, you will be able to show that this theory is so rigid, it's so constrained that it can only live in certain, uh, certain, certain parameters, in certain um, region of the parameter space. Okay. And we also want this framework, this conformal bootstrap framework that we want to develop to be flexible. So not only apply to two dimensions where we know there are these additional structure, but be able to work in any dimension, hopefully uh, integer at least. <clears throat> and we want it to only rely on basic ingredients, for instance, the symmetries, uh, the number of unstable direction, okay, which will translate in number of relevant operators in, in the RG sense. And then we want to be uh, not based on a Lagrangian or a given Hamiltonian, and we want it to be rigorous, meaning that 
we want to be able to precisely state the uh, in interval of, of confidence or the region that we will determine. We want this to be rigorous, not subject to statistical error. Okay, with this, uh, with this uh, introduction, let's go uh, to, the, um, to the juice. Okay, and now we'll switch to uh, uh, not slides, but uh, uh, handwritten notes. So the idea is to um, first of all let me let me discuss the framework that I we will be working with, and the framework is the framework of quantum field theory. So. Um, So eventually, you, we, you have in mind a statistical mechanical uh, system where, which is defined in the lattice. So you have a partition function, for instance, on this lattice, which is some, the sum over all uh, spin configurations of some Hamiltonian. And then, uh, but in a, in the, at the fixed point, okay, in the theory, you have basically intuitively, you have zoom out the theory you have uh, you, you looked at the, at the theory from very far away and then it makes sense to describe the theory with a continuum theory so we will um, we will use a, a language of quantum field theory and so we will have a partition function not not the one described in the lattice but the partition function which is defined as a path integral of the field configuration of some um, action um Euclidean action which is a functional acting on certain fields when i write in this way i don't mean that we actually have an action with fields written in terms of lagrangian but this is just a, a, a way to say that there is a path integral there is a measure that way that weights in a certain way each field configuration okay so this we don't we don't really need um an action uh, written in terms of local operators and the way in, in, in which this arrow works is that you start from um, the way you have to interpret this, uh, this arrow passing from the lattice to the quantum field theory is that uh, normally on, on the lattice, you have some observables okay, uh, that are defined on the lattice and of which, from, of which you take some expectation value, meaning you take uh, averages of these uh, observables weighted by uh, your, your expo exponential of the, of the Hamiltonian. Okay, eventually they can be uh, different. And then <clears throat> the assumptions that there exist um, certain uh, uh, combination of lattice observables for which the following limit, which is defined as the scaling limit, is, is well defined and gives rises to correlation function uh, corresponding to uh, local quantum operators. Right? Okay, so the assumption is that there exists a limit for the lattice spacing going to zero of certain observables defined in the lattice multiplied by uh, the product of um, the lattice spacing elevated to some power, okay, product of one to going to n. And this, um, okay, of course, is obviously simply uh, some of the configurations by one four. Okay, and this limit gives gives rises to expectation values of certain local operators defined as uh, again as averages of uh, field config over the field configuration space weighted by the path integral that I just uh, that I uh, introduced before. Okay, so the idea is that is that this limit exists. And uh, in the continuum limit, you will be able to define a path integral, and this path integral will, will allow you to construct correlation function, and this correlation function, in fact, defines uh, local operators. On top of this, 
Okay, so this is not only we use quantum field theory, but we will restrict to unitary quantum field theory. Or in the language of uh, Euclidean, um, Euclidean quantum field theory, uh, by unit we mean reflection positive. And I will come back on this. Mostly, I will come back on the implication of this, but also uh, I, will try, I will try to define a little bit better what does it what it means to have a reflection positive theory. But as, as, as far as the consequences of some are concerned, having a reflection positive theory means that the scaling dimension of the operators in their theory are not um, arbitrary, but they have to satisfy some uh, lower bound, some, uh, some bounds. So the dimension of the operator must be larger than a certain value that depends on the operator, of course, which is larger than zero. Most, most of the time, except for the unitarity, perhaps. Then uh, the central charge of the, of the theory, which for people used to uh, work in two dimensions is a very basic concept, is also positive. And there are also another thing that you can, you can um, show that there are no logarithms around. No log. So no log CFT. Okay, examples of well, there are many examples of examples of theories of, uh, of this form, but perhaps it's more useful to mention the theories that are not of this form. Okay, uh, so theories that are that do not satisfy um, these requirements are, for instance, in theories in uh, non-integer dimensions, theories with fractional number of, uh, of of fields, for instance, the ON model when n is not uh, integer or uh, the q pot model when q is no integer. Uh, percolation is, is an example of non-unitary theory. The random walk uh, is an example of non-unitary theory. And also among the minimal models, there are uh, there is the, the simplest minimal model, which is the Li Yang singularity, which is not unit. But, uh, so, but there are also many interesting theories that are worth uh, studying and that are unitary. So we will focus on those. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> so let's start discussing what does it mean to have a conformal symmetry, first of all, and what are, what's the form of conformal transformation next. So um, in the larger or equal than two. So uh, as many of you know, uh, among all possible operators of the theory, there is the one which is special, which is the stress tensor. The stress tensor uh, is usually defined, well, can be defined in many ways, but one way to define it is to, as the response of your system under um, a, tr a local transformation of your, of, of your coordinates. Okay, or in the metric. So you have your action, you make a variation of, uh, of for instance, uh, you, you make a change of coordinate, your uh, X mu going to X mu plus some uh, local uh, uh, shift. So this Xi mu can depend on X as well. And then you look at how the system behaves. Okay, you, you introduce a tension and then, uh, uh, so you introduce some sort of elasticity, and then you look at how the system behaves. So what, which, what better way of looking at the response by looking at the action? So the stress tensor is defined as indeed uh, the way in which the action changes. So uh, you will have an integral in dtx. And then, uh, of course, uh, if you just translate uh, the, si the system, nothing should happen. So uh, whatever whatever changes of course uh, uh, whatever change of uh, of course it has to be proportional to the derivative of this uh, quantity psi otherwise it's just a translation of the system and so the the, the parameter that uh, 
that uh, enters in this in this uh, infinitesimal res uh, response is indeed the stress tensor. So it's a it's an object with two indices, which means that it's not a scalar. Uh, it transforms on the <coughs> rotations of of the, the SOD rotation, Euclidean rotation. It has two indices, so it's a spin two object. And uh, by looking at um, property the, the symmetries of your theory, you can infer a lot of things about this stress tensor. In particular, translation. Uh, impose uh, the condition that this object is indeed conserved. And when I write in this way, I, what I really mean is that there exists a word identity for this object that holds inside correlation function at distinct points. And then when you have, there are singularities parameterized by delta functions, which uh, make this object the generator of translation. Okay, but I will write like this for shorthand. Then uh, there is a your theory. Uh, we assume that the theory, uh, the continuum theory that described the, the fixed point is not only in translation invariant, it's also rotation invariant. So the, we will impose an SOD rotation. Um, so uh, Euclidean rotation. And this imposes that uh, the T mu nu is actually symmetric, or there is a choice of T mu nu which is actually symmetric. So you can, uh, let's say, add pieces to make it symmetric. And again, this holds some side correlation function at distinct point. And then since we want to describe uh, fixed points, um, generically at fixed point we have, uh, well, not generically, sorry. By definition, at fixed point, we have invariance under scale transformations that we parameterize as, uh, a rescaling of the coordinates, lambda x mu. So under this transformation, it means that uh, the mu psi nu is actually lambda the metric g mu. Nu. This is just a metric one one. Well, it's delta mu. Nu. <clears throat> it's just the diagonal uh, is a the identity matrix, but I'll I'll write G to this thing to case. Um, okay, uh, in this case, uh, your vari the variation of your action is actually proportional to uh, lambda integral dx of the trace of the stress tensor. And so you would like the action to be invariant under your system to be invariant under these dilatations, which means, well, uh, generically, this is not enough to conclude that this, the trace of the stress tensor should be zero. Okay. There could be uh, caveats. And in two dimensions, uh, if you assume unitarity, then you can prove that the, the, the scale invariant implies conformal invariant. Uh, in high dimension, there is no rigorous proof. There are perturbative proofs that you can uh, you can work out, but for us, it would just be an assumption. Okay, so we will assume we will assume that T mu is zero. And in fact, there are counter examples in high dimensions where scale invariance does not imply some form. Okay, they're a bit pathological, but still, uh, you can find counter examples. So. It's not really clear what's the minimal condition uh, in general dimension to ensure this. So for us, it will just be an assumption. Okay. Um, all right. So under this assumption, then if the, the trace of the stress tensor is zero, you see immediately that you, you get for free additional, uh, well, in principle, you get for free additional um, transformations uh, for which since the, uh, sorry, for which, uh, since the action, the variation of the action, we wrote it as uh, t, mu, t mu nu, uh, t mu nu, uh, delta g mu nu. And this we said uh, is the mu psi nu. And eventually using the symmetries of the stress tensor, you, you can add the symmetrized part, the nu psi nu over two. Okay, 
whenever this combination is proportional to uh, whenever this combination is proportional to g mu again, we re we recreate the, the trace of the stress tensor, which by assumption is zero, and so this is a legitimate uh, transformation that leaves the action invariant. So under the assumption that the trace of the stress tensor is zero, we get for free, in a sense, all, trans all, the, all the transformation to get invariant under all transformation x mu going to x mu plus xi mu such that the following equation holds the mu xi mu plus the new xi mu so this symmetrized combination is the, is proportional to g mu nu. now if you look if you take the trace of this object you see that the proportionality factor is in fact two uh sorry it's two over d uh, scalar product d over psi. So this is a this is a famous killing equation for conformal transformation, whose solution gives us the uh, the form of the conformal transformation. Okay, just to remind you how the story goes in two dimension. Okay. make a parallelism in 2D, it passes to complex coordinates, for instance, t plus ix, and z bar uh, t minus pi plus minus ix, and then define the derivative with respect to z, which is the derivative with respect to t, minus i derivative with respect to x over two. And then this, this killing equation just becomes uh, equivalent to say that if you, if you send z to z plus epsilon z is some function then the killing equation uh, is equivalent to say that uh, the z bar of epsilon is equal to z which means that any holomorphic function um, uh, epsilon of z so epsilon should be a function of z and not z bar um, um, make the um, works, okay? which means that any holomorphic transformation is satisfies this, the killing equation. It is a, a huge set of transformation. Um, unfortunately, not all these transformation are, are invertible and not, all, not they are not all defined on the plane. Okay, so among those, among all holomorphic transformation. Uh, there is a subgroup, which is SL2C, which, by the way, is isomorphic to SO, the Lorentz group in four dimension, SO3, comma one, which is the which can which are indeed invertible and can be uh, extended to the whole plane, and is what defines the so-called global conformal group. Uh, which has to be uh, this the, the differentiated has to be um, not not confused with the local one, which is indeed the set of all holomorphic transformation. And these uh, global conformal transformation are uh, of the form z going to a z plus b over c z plus d with a constraint with a b c and d um, uh, c numbers. And uh, the constraint AD minus BC equal one. So this is the, conf the global conformal group, and let's have a look at how it looks like because it's going to be very similar in high dimension. So among these, um, you have go uh, you have uh, Z going, for instance, in Z plus B, which are translation. So that's great. Uh, we recover something that we wanted. There is z going to z plus e to the i theta, which are a rotation. Uh, 
which is a, again a find and something we wanted to begin with. And for those, uh, we didn't even need uh, to impose uh, the killing equation, or, or if you want, the killing equation is somewhat trivial. Then there are dilatations, uh, z going to z uh, times some number, let's say a positive number. Well, that has a, and then there's a, a final one, which is less obvious and is uh, uh, somewhat a novelty, which are so-called special conformal transformation in general. And in this case, just corresponds to uh, inverting, well, sending a point to infinity or sending the infinity to a point. And these are the, uh, uh, can be thought as special conformal transformation. So in, in two dimensions, the story goes similar to this global conformal group, but there is no analog of the local one. Okay, so the conformal, the, the solution of the killing equation in general dimension uh, um, set of transformation. So in, in D larger than two, we lose the concept of holomorphicity. We lose, we don't need to pass to complex coordinate, we just work in usual uh, X mu coordinate. And uh, again, we have, we can, we can show that the, the most general solution of, uh, of the Killing equation are of the form uh, X mu going to X mu plus psi mu at the infinitesimal level. So I'll just write the infinitesimal form of the transformation. And uh, x mu can be, can be a, a, a constant object. So again, it's the translation. Uh, x mu can be proportional to x mu with an anti-symmetric matrix. This is our rotation. Uh, X mu can be proportional again to X mu, but now with the you want a trace, so a constant piece is again dilatation or scaling transformation. And then there is the exotic one, which is uh, which is the one that we get for free once we assume the trace, the, the vanishing of the trace of the stress tensor, which are the special conformal transformation, which look like they're parameterized again by uh, a single vector parameter, which I will call B mu. So it's twice B rho X rho X mu minus B mu X square. And these are special conformal transformations. Notice that, notice that uh, the parameters of this group are uh, the parameters of rotation. So a vector that has D parameters. Then um, the parameters of rotation, which is an anti-symmetric matrix, so D, D minus one over two. There is a dilatation, so another parameter. And then there is this special conformal transformation that are parameterized again by the vector. So if you sum this, you get something like D plus D minus one, D minus two over two. Um, so this defines the conformal group. in D larger than two, or in D, or D equal to, if you restrict to the global one. And you can show that this uh, group of transformation, first of all, can be, uh, can be integrated to a final form, which I'm not going to write, because it's not important. And uh, most importantly, they uh, define as, uh, the generator can be arranged in such a way that this, uh, the, this, the, the algebra of this transformation is isomorphic to uh, the group of SO D plus one comma one. So again, the, the, the Lorentz group in uh, D plus two dimensions. Um, 
Is there any question about this? Very standard. But if there is any question, please. Okay, so there are no questions. So I will just pass to the algebra now, uh, which actually is, as I just said, isomorphic to this um, uh, the, the special orthogonal group in uh, with signature d plus one one. And um, uh, so you can derive the algebra in many ways. Uh, there is a smart way, which is to construct the generator uh, using the, the stress tensor, okay, and then guess. Uh, with, a, with a very smart answer, you can guess the uh, the action of this generator on the stress tensor itself, uh, because it has to the action of a generator produce an infinitesimal transformation it has to maintain the properties of symmetries, uh, tracelessness, uh, conservation. So you can guess this form, and then you can uh, from there you can obtain the algebra. It's very nice, and you can find this this uh, in. Uh, Various lectures, for instance, in the test lecture by Simon Tuffin. Or you can do something more brute force. You can implement this transformation on, on functions of coordinates, and then you can just find the differential form of the, of, the, of, the, of the generators acting on the space of functions. And then once you have the differential form, you can just take the commutators. And this will produce for you the algebra. So without losing time in these details, I can just show you the algebra, which I reported here for, uh, for shortness. Um, so let me, uh, the, then the various, I, didn't, I denoted the, um, the various generator uh, of translation as P mu. Uh, M mu nu are the generators of rotation. D is the generator, generator of dilatation. And K mu, again, is the generator of uh, special conformal transformation. Okay, among all possible um, commutators, there are uh, a bunch of one that I would like to focus on. First of all, um, the first line uh, tells us that uh, the generator of translations act as a rising operator for the dilatation operator. So if you have an, eigen, an eigenvalue of the dilatation, then acting with the translation, you increase um, the dimension, the, the eigen, this eigenvalue uh, by one unit. And similarly, with the special conformal transformation, you lower this eigenvalue by one unit. So these are sort of raising and lowering the operators. And this will be important later when we construct the form of the irreducible representation. Then, of course, these two objects do not commute among each other. And in particular, uh, doing uh, a translation and a special conformal transformation later or vice versa is equivalent to uh, rescaling your, your, uh, your system and rotating it, rotating it a little bit. And this relation here. Uh, this third line is important, will be important for when we try to derive constraints coming from unitarity. Because as we will see in our definition of conjugation, uh, P and K are conjugate one of the other. And then, of course, there are standard uh, commutation relations. For instance, the, the fourth and the, the fifth line just uh, state that. Uh, P and K are indeed vectors of SOD. Uh, the, the second to last line uh, is just is the usual commutation relation of SOD. Okay. And finally, um, there are a bunch of uh, abelian subgroups, so translation are abelian, special conformal transformation are abelian. And, and interestingly, uh, the dilatation are a scalar object. So the commutation relation with M is zero, which means that you, by, see, once you have two uh, generators that um, commute among each other, uh, you can generalize them um, simultaneously. And that's what we, we're going to do later. Just to draw a parallelism again with two dimensions, these are uh, equivalent to uh, the, the algebra of the global conformal transformation, which are a subgroup of the all possible generators. 
So if you remember the generators of, of uh, Virasoro, of the local conformal algebra are uh, this Ln and L, L bar n. Okay, if you take a sub, the, the subgroup is generated only by L0, L1, and L minus one, and the corresponding bar. And the, <clears throat> if, you, if you want to recognize what's what, um, the combination L0 plus, plus L0 bar is the dilatation. The, the combination with the minus is rotation. And then you have a combination that gives you the generate, the translation and combination that gives you the special conformal transformation. And the algebra, uh, you can reproduce the algebra that I, we had in the, the previous lines by simply using a simplified version of the Pirazoro algebra. Since you, you, don't, you never see the P is proportional. To the central charge because either the only the only way to, to see this play to, to see this piece would be to take m uh, and m equal to minus n so one and minus one but then this piece m cube by minus m uh, would, would be zero uh, so you, you never see this piece and you only see the one the first the first part um okay then now let me go back to the notes. Now that we have uh, we have defined the algebra, we can start constructing um, the representations of of this algebra and start having a look at how uh, how they look like. So I'll try to be quick because I'm running I'm already running out of running late. So the idea is that um, oops, sorry. so the idea is, is since the generators of rotation and the generator of translation uh, they commute, we can uh, diagonalize them together, and so we will classify uh, states in our, in, in our in our systems by two quantum numbers. One, one quantum number is the scaling dimension, which is the um, eigenvalue of the dilatation operator, the delta. So D um, acting on a state with dimension delta and quantum number RR that I will uh, discuss in a second is going to be delta, delta R. And then the second set of quantum numbers that we want to use are the SOD uh, quantum, num uh, quantum number. So we will specify in which SOD the reducible representation are this object uh, transformed in. So if you act with the generator M mu nu to a state in a given irreducible representation, this transforms as uh, uh, with the representative in the irreducible representation little r of the generator m mu nu. And this is going to be some matrix in the appropriate representation. Okay. So these two quantum numbers uh, um, specify uh, the properties under dilatation and under uh, rotation. And now we have to, uh, to understand what happens when you act with the other generator. Notice that this uh, delta and R are the analog of the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic weights into, into the mesh. Okay, so um, at this point, okay, we have this state, which is some irreducible representation of both uh, rotation and, and Okay, the end has a given again value of dilatation. And then when you act with, uh, uh, with the generator of translation and dilatation, uh, sorry, and special conformal transformation, we have seen that the result is to uh, lower or raise the again value of dilatation. But that's not the only thing that it does. So if we act with P mu, Okay, we will get a state which is uh, which has delta plus one, 
eigenvalue of dilatation, but then it will be in some irreducible representation of sorry, what happened. Uh, in some irreducible representation of, uh, of SOD, R prime, which is in the tensor product of R with the uh, represent, which is which was the old irreducible representation with uh, the vector representation. So to say it uh, in a simple way, we added uh, an index. So we have to make sure we have what we got. Uh, when you add an index, is not an irreducible representation, of course, because you can symmetrize and symmetrize contract with some such corner. So you have to decompose the result into uh, irreducible representation, and you can do that. And similarly, when you act with k mu, what you will get is a state with lower dimension by one unit, and some representation r second, which is which. Uh, belongs to the tensor product R with U. Now, if you keep going, you can keep going. Uh, you can keep you can keep going uh, in both in both directions. And eventually, uh, if you if you uh, if you never hit a threshold, if you have it, never hit a zero, your dimension will become arbitrarily negative. Um, so this is not something that we want for various reasons. Uh, first of all, because we'll see that um, in a unitary theory, uh, dimension has to be bounded from, from below. Uh, but this is also uh, intuitive in a quantum mechanical system uh, if you want to, to be stable. Um, another, another way to see it is that if you have negative dimensions, then fluctuation of a certain correlation function will grow with distance. And this is not something that very that usually want. So although there are theories with negative uh, dimensions, we, we, we restrict to um, representation of the conformal algebra such that at certain point, this, uh, this ladder will terminate. So we, we restrict. to uh, reduce the representation uh, such that there exists a state uh, with, the, with minimal dimension delta mean in some irreducible representation R star uh, that when you act with the, gen with the generator of special conformal transformation, you get zero. Uh, this state is called a primary state. And uh, from now on, a question? Yes. Uh, yeah, so you're making this assumption inside an irreducible representation. Uh, do you make the same assumption for the whole theory or just for each representation? Um, I'm assuming that the theory does not contain representation that, that are not of this kind. Okay, but you could have a, a, a large number of representations in your theory with uh, dimensions unbounded from below, right? So a, lo a, a lot of primary states, but um, tend to right. that, that, that can be, I will also assume that at some, the, the, over, the, the minimal dimension that I can have in a theory is bounded from below. So there will be a minimal dimension, even among all possible representations. Okay. But we will see this. This is a consequence of assuming reflection positivity or unitary. But for now, it's just an assumption. It's just a restriction for the, for the sake of this discussion. Um, all right. So from now on, I was saying, I will, dis I will denote the representation we label uh, representation with uh, the dimension delta and the representation, the SOD representation of the primary. primary. And all other states that I now we'll discuss in a second can be obtained 
from the primary uh, just simply by repeat, uh, acting uh, iteratively uh, the raising operator TV. Let me make uh, one, one, one small comment because in those of you that are familiar with two dimension my uh, might know the, the, the definition primary state, but I would like to stress that in two dimension, the definition is slightly different. So in two dimension, this definition is uh, this um, red definition is what the nodes uh, identify, if you want, the so-called quasi-primary. Primary. Meaning those that satisfy L minus one apply to H, H bar equal L bar minus one to H, H bar equals zero. Instead, the, the, the primary state in two dimension. So primary operators in two dimension uh, are those that satisfy uh, a similar one, but for any uh, negative um, L, for, N, for any L minus N or L bar minus N. Uh, sorry, Alessandro, is not L plus one, maybe? Uh, Yes, sorry. You're right. I, I so. Yes, thank you. Um, all right. Yes, of course. The minus the minus n are the rating, and, and the plus are the lower. Thank you very much. Um, for any n larger or equal than one. So this, this do not do not confuse the definition. Uh, every uh, every primary is also a quasi primary, of course, but it's not true vice versa. Particular uh, a complete uh, irreducible representation of the Virasoro algebra contains infinitely many uh, representations of the uh, of the global conformal algebra. In particular, contains infinitely many quasi primary. But since we don't have this distinction in high dimensions, we, we don't have to differentiate quasi primary and primary, and we will only talk about primary. So, just to have a picture of how an irreducible representation in high dimension looks like, uh, let's take a simple example. Uh, for instance, um, Let's take uh, delta, let's take, let's take the MS state, which is delta, and then I will call the representation, I will choose um, the spin L representation, meaning uh, this is the analog of the usual uh, angular momentum spin L representation. It exists for any D, okay? It, it, it's the one associated to tensors with L indices, if you want. And this will come back over and over in our discussion, so it's it's nice, it's good to have uh, in mind how they look like. And so again, there will be um, make a plot of dimension versus uh, irreducible representation uh, of of of, um, of SOD. Uh, so this will be let's say R, and this will be delta. So as I said, there is. Um, the primary state, which has dimension and given L zero, uh, sorry, um, L zero here, and some delta zero. And then when you start acting with the, the, the raising operators, as I said, you can create different representations. In particular, in this case, it's clear what you can create because you can either uh, contract an index, and so you will get uh, something which has L0 minus one and delta zero plus one, or you can symmetrize the new index, and so create a tensor, a state in a, 
uh, in spin L, L0 plus one representation and so on and so forth when you're acting with more uh, raising operators you can start creating um, sort of um, picture of this block okay? and you pass from one to the next with p mu again uh, creating or uh, sorry contracting or uh, symmetrizing the, the index so creating larger representation or small um, the, the bottom of this uh, of this tree is, is the primary while all the other operators are called the same okay i think i'm uh, running out of time so um, this is a good place to stop because uh, next i would like to discuss correlation function um, so we will see that uh, the structure this is the conformal algebra that we introduced um, constrain uh, is able to constrain in a very rigid way uh, correlation function of small with small number of operators in particular two and three and starting with four instead we have some freedom um, but this will be the topic of the next lecture so i think i'll, I'll stop here uh, because and uh, see and i'll stay i'll stick around for questions of course all right uh, thanks alessandro for the first lecture <clears throat> we do have time for questions so please go ahead if you have any It looks like um no good morning i'd like to ask one question concerning the conformal invariance you get from scale invariance and rotation invariance what you discussed at some point yes yeah because you were saying you were bringing forward the standard argument going back to the 70s or wherever uh, that this formally works but then i have a specific question Maybe you are aware of the famous uh, two dimension example of Cardi and Riva, which actually showed that there the conformal current is not uh, conserved. Can you explain better what is going wrong with your simple argument in that particular case? Are you familiar with that example? I'm familiar with the example. Now, I sincerely don't remember what goes wrong. Um, so let's see. Um, so the, the idea, so you, you're asking when um, when scale invariance implies conformal invariance. Yeah, I mean, in particular, what they did, as far as I remember, they actually showed, yes, you have rotation invariance satisfies, yes, scale invariance, global scale invariance is there. And then yet they show special conformal invariance does not hold. And, to, and they make well, a very explicit con, uh, calculation for this. Well, the, the, I always fail to see what is going wrong with this general argument. Uh, where, where's the catch? Well, the, the proof of Polchinski that I was referring to uses unit size because otherwise you cannot prove that uh, the stress tensor is zero as, a, as an operator inside mm -hmm. any correlation function. So uh, if they don't assume unitarity, then uh, I, I don't know how to even prove this. Okay. So do they do they assume unitarity or reflection positivity? I'm not sure. I mean, they put this in a hydrodynamic language, so they do not explicitly discuss it. So I, I'm I'm really not sure. Mm -hmm. So I, I well, my bet would be that uh, if if you give up this assumption, then then you have counterexamples. So possibly, uh, yeah, possibly. Okay, well, thank you. You do know counterexamples in a high dimension. So in yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, in that example, what happens is that the stress of the trace of the stress tensor is a total derivative. Uh, so th th that's the first. Uh, that's not zero; it's a total derivative, which mm -hmm. doesn't contradict to the integral of the of the trace of the stress tensor being zero. So you can upgrade it. Uh, and then you can ask yourself, well, can we remove it uh, to make it uh, totally zero? 
and that does not work because there are some conditions on the improvement of of uh, of the trace of the stress tensor and those conditions are not verified so you cannot you can actually not make it mm -hmm. uh, zero yeah and the model is not unitary so that's not yeah actually since uh, since there are many of us i i ask people who ask questions uh, present themselves because otherwise it's a bit uh, like questions coming from uh, anonymous people it's a bit uh, <laughs> it's it's not ideal uh yeah so please go ahead for the questions uh hi i'm uh jacopo viti can you hear me yes i am so uh, i have a question about this uh <clears throat> irreducible representation of the conformal algebra so in the following you which kind of uh, uh angular momentum representation you are going to consider also half integer or they are just integer representation and well, i mean right so in in these lectures i will speak to well mostly scalars and integer integer l so uh, not not which means boson uh, people have considered i mean you can consider any of them and there, there are works in the, in the literature considering, even in the in, in conformal bootstrap, even considering fermions. Uh, so the discussion change is just technically more complicated, but it doesn't, it, it goes through the same way. Okay, thank you. Anyway. But perhaps it's obvious we should add that on general grounds, L can be either integer or non-integer. Right, right. Yeah. It cannot be. It cannot be an arbitrary real number in high dimensions. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It cannot be complex, for instance. No, no, no. That okay. be complex. Thank you. So yeah, I have one. Raúl, the Chiara, I have one question. Uh, you have implied uh, here you write the representation in terms of uh, the states. Yeah. Uh, so I assume that uh, in any dimension, the correspondence state operator uh, goes as a learning two dimension, right? Exactly. Exactly. The, the only difference is now you don't have, when you do radial quantization, we will discuss this. You don't have sphere codes, you have spheres. But uh, so the, the states live on, live on spheres. Uh, concentric spheres, but the, the discussion is the same. Thanks. Okay, hello. I sense, yeah, hello. Uh, okay, like uh, I have a naive question, like, uh, like here we have seen in D greater than two that only global conformal uh, symmetry is there and we have written down the generators. So like, can we construct some local generators like, like in T, uh, D equal to two for D greater than two, like which are, which may not be well defined in uh, like full space, but locally. And then we can, uh, can we possibly organize all these infinite primaries like kind of a, Bharma module kind of thing in D greater than two also? Is it possible? Um, okay, I think there have been attempts, um, but uh, I'm not aware of any su successful attempts. So I don't think there is any extension, well, very simple extension of, of the result of symmetry to a higher dimension, but at least I'm not aware of. So um, I would say no. Um, people have tried. Okay. Yeah, one thing that might be worth pointing out is an analog of the Coleman Mendula theorem for CFTs that Jibay Dov and Maldesan proved that puts strong constraints on such a thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also have a question. So uh, my name is uh, Gabriele Dubaldo, I'm a PhD student in Paris. 
And uh, I have a, a basic question. So when we uh, talked about the properties of the stress energy tensor that are valid inside correlation functions, yeah. um, if, if I'm not mi mistaken, you said that uh, the symmetry of the stress energy tensor is only valid as a word identity yeah. in correlation functions. But isn't, uh, um, is, uh, if we the, use the, uh, the definition in terms of variation with respect to a metric, uh, wouldn't that be true uh, also outside of correlation functions? I mean, let's say in, uh, in sort of a, uh, axiomatic approach to so CFT, where we suppose we have a, a stress energy tensor, uh, is, um, is a, mm, I mean, the way you, you define it is by doing a variation of the action, but we can also have a, a CFT without an action. So, uh, right. Um, so the thing is, is uh, the yeah, symmetry right. is I mean, only valid inside correlation functions? Um, so the word, the word identity is defined inside correlation functions. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's very, very much like the conservation is valid inside correlation functions. Then, of course, define, you, you assume that there is an operator with that, which is in the and the spin to uh, representation of SOD, and that by the, by construction is um, is symmetric. Um, so in a sense, I mean, if you if you if you define it as a as a variation of the action, this comes from the path integral, and this comes from correlation function. So the, the their, its properties are the one dictated by what it ends. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you if you think about it as a, an abstract object in some reducible representation, then in that case, it's by construction, it's, it's, it's a okay. I see. The difference is in 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 the contact terms. If you want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I was only uh, confused about the distinction for the symmetry property. The others are are clear. Right. Thank you. Yeah, these two objects are equivalent up to contact terms. Good, thank you. Uh, actually, I should add that uh, some of the things that people are asking, these are very good questions and uh, and uh, we we might have separate discussions on them later on uh, to clarify them completely and you know the participants are uh, encouraged to initiate their own discussions they can do it i think by starting uh, their own meetings on on zoom and they can uh, popularize these meetings via the slack channel so that other people can join them and try to coordinate so that's uh, so people should be proactive to to start a sort of informal discussions. Any other questions? So, so, so in principle, we have another lecture planned at eleven thirty, right, Alessandro? So that's right. So, so sh should you make on a break and then uh, come back at uh, eleven thirty? Yeah, I can use a coffee. Yes. Okay, then, I, then I'm going to stop the recording and I see you all back in, uh, in 15 minutes or so. Thank Cheers, you. everyone. Thank you.